Cannabinoids are a very broad chemical term. So I'll focus on phytocannabinoids first. These predominant ones are the ones being produced from cannabis sativa L. And I've got four here on this slide, THC acid, CBD acid, CBG acid, and CBC acid. And these are the molecules that the plant makes. Um, there are other processed cannabinoids that come from these through a process known as decarboxylation, where you remove that carboxylic acid function on the aromatic ring. And these can come from intentional purposes or from other means due to storage or in terms of how I use that when I heat the products to introduce them via vaporization and volatilization. The four that would come from the subsequent acids that were acids that were mentioned before are THC, CBD, CBG, and CBC. Um, very small, simple chemical change, very big difference to the body. The cannabinoid acids are not known to impart psychoactivity, certainly not like THC. Um, and it can, as you can see, a small chemical change eliminating a CO2 molecule can certainly cause a radical physiological change. Each of these molecules are, are very different in their physiological potential. I think it's always interesting to note that THC and CBD have the exact same number of atoms and the exact same molecular weight, but they're oriented in very different ways and therefore cause very different physiological functions. THC being psychoactive, CBD being non-psychoactive in the same sense. CBG acid. This is kind of the um, beginning or starting molecule for other cannabinoid acids and based on your plant's genetics and how those enzymes are expressed from them, you can result in high amounts or equal amounts of THC acid and CBD acid. These are what the plant makes. The plant's machine, molecular machinery stops at production of the cannabinoid acids. And you've heard me mention the process of decarboxylation. This is generated by heat. The process using heat causes this. It can be whether I'm heating it um, intentionally in a process from a manufacturing sense to create concentrates. It can also come from heating butter if I was using butter to extract and infuse into an edible. Um, it can also come from the vaporization or combustion process that you see utilizing the plant directly to inhale it. This process, as you can see on here, it's that simple little carboxylic acid group that leaves. So it will liberate CO2 and you will end up with the neutral uh, cannabinoid THC or CBD respectively on this slide. There are a number of different methods that you can use for decarboxylation. I'm often asked, how long does it take? And I'll provide the smart aleck answer of, well, how hot are you intending to get it? So it, it will happen at room temperature if you can wait a couple of lifetimes for it to happen. That's hot enough to generate it in a tiny, tiny amount, but not in any practical or relevant time scale for us. So we therefore turn towards increasing the temperature in general, every 10 degrees Celsius that you increase something, the reaction rate will double. So you can imagine if I go up a couple of tens of degrees Celsius, things that might take infinite lifetimes to happen all of a sudden start happening on hours or appreciable time frames for us. Um, it is a time and temperature relative equation. So we now see very commonly vacuum ovens are used. This makes sure that there's no oxygen present to cause unwanted side reactions such as THC oxidizing and degrading to CBN um, and will clearly help also remove the CO2 from the environment, which will drive the decarboxylation as well. There are also other sophisticated pieces of equipment now being designed, special decarboxylation vessels, such that they're designed to maintain a little pressure and keep some of the terpenes in the mixture as well. The challenge that you have is I can only go so hot because I'll volatilize anything else that I may want to keep, such as terpenes, which are more volatile, or eventually volatilize the cannabinoids if I try and push that too much. So I am limited in how hot I can make this process. So I'll have to wait a certain amount of time. And it's usually a, a, number, a good number of hours uh, to days, depending upon how they do it nowadays. Um, this is necessary to decarboxylate and make THC, CBD, or the other neutral cannabinoids and again, it does also happen during vaping or uh, combustion and smoking of your flower products. Um, it is a key step in the concentrate process in terms of how will I go and elucidate uh, CBD isolate or distill and make high purity THC as well. So cannabinoids are one key part of the cannabis plant. Another critical aspect is terpenes. 
Um, terpenes are secondary metabolites. They're often produced down different biological pathways from the cannabinoids. There are some parts that are similar amongst the two. The plant will use um, common intermediates, if you will, to send some down a cannabinoid path and some down the terpene path. Today, there are more than 150 different terpenes known to cannabis. I should mention we're up to almost 1300 different molecules have been found in and on the, the cannabis plant. Um, that number continues to go up as we find more and more cultivars and look further at the molecules there. Some of the more prevalent terpenes that we see inside of cannabis and these molecules are present in everyday common uh, plants and foods that you guys find as well. Linalool from lavender, limonene in citrus peels like orange, um, humulene, very prevalent in hops, um, bisabolo and chamomile, and caryophylline is very prevalent in black pepper. They all are known to have some sort of individualized properties in a therapeutic sense, whether they be stress relief, anxiety relief, um, anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial properties. Um, you can also see something such as terpinaline by itself may have sedative properties, but in combination with all of the cannabinoids and other terpenes prevalent, we find that higher terpinaline based profiles are more likely to be the ones uplifting and energetic. Um, I hesitate to use the word sativa because I think that classification system is, you know, now being found to not be robust enough for all of what we know. But those types of plant products, such as a jack hair, if you will, um, are known to be more uplifting and energetic. They are high in terpinaline. And it's interesting that terpinaline in a single molecule study caused sedation in some of those studies. So therefore, I cannot extrapolate because this profile has a, a large amount of terpinaline relative to others. Will it cause sleepiness? You know, it, it in fact causes the other when I put it together with the rest of the terpenes and the cannabinoids. That whole cannabis composition uh, consideration, the entourage or ensemble effects are really key to understand. It's about all the molecules at once playing together at once, not just one of them by themselves. Myrcene is the other one. I think there's some suggestion that this one is involved in couch lock or maybe involved in sedation we have a hard time scientifically substantiating that to any great extent. We don't see that in the literature. I think it's interesting to note myrcene's popular in mangoes. Um, you may hear eat some mangoes before you consume your cannabis and you'll get more of the sedative types of effects. Well, it better be the right mango. There are about 4,000 different mangoes and not all of them are high in myrcene. So knowing which one, you know, would be very difficult. Um, I think you probably experienced some mangoes taste different than others. So we're familiar that they are different. Um, but yeah, it was interesting to me when I discovered that there were more than 4,000 of them known um, because I certainly like some over others. And I'm not sure which ones might potentiate my cannabis effects.